Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can all hear me. Um, my name is Timothy Croshaw. Uh, I'm delighted to be your host this afternoon for the first Healthy Happy Places Biophilic Design webinar, part of our webinar series. Uh, by way of background, I'm an international planning and development consultant uh, working with my colleagues Holly and Rachel on the Healthy Happy Places programme, which we'll hear about shortly. Um, and the chair of the Tees Valley Nature Partnership, and this year I'm the president of the Royal Town Planning Institute. So before we actually start, I'm going to go through the agenda. So we've got Bill Browning from the partner from Terrapin Bright Green, and Bill will be talking about exploring the science supporting biophilic design. Dr. Abby Terran Jones, clinical psychologist and nature and outdoor therapist for Tees Esk and Weir Valley's NHS Foundations Trust, will be speaking about ecotherapy using nature therapeutically. Natalie Baxter, Head of Workspace at The Home Group, will be talking about biophilic design in the workplace on behalf of The Home Group. And Professor Alistair Scott, Professor of Environmental Geography, Chartered Town Planner and Chair of Building with Nature Standards Group, will be talking about biophilic cities, exploring the smart biophilic city interface to deliver improved urban planning and governance. There will be a panel question and answer session at the end today. We really want your evaluation and feedback, so please send us that. We can do this. We can make this even better than it is right now. Um, and then we hope to close at half past two. Before we launch straight in, just one thing to think about is the bigger context of what we're doing. So Rachel, do you want to talk to us about the rest of the programme and the rest of our webinars? Thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Turnbull. I'm a programme manager for the Academic Health and Science Network. And it's just to give a bit of context really to these webinars as they are part of a wider series of events we're running as part of the Healthy Happy Places programme. So this is our second one in the series on biophilic design, but our first one was on healing environments in December. And there's all the resources and videos there if you want to access those. And then just a list of dates for your diary as well for the future ones. You will get those dates sent out as well in the post event follow up. So the Healthy Happy Places programme, essentially, we're looking at how we support and create better mental health and wellbeing, but doing that through the built environment. Um, and by built environment, I know there's a lot of built environment professionals on, but there might not be um, some from that sector as well. So built environment, we're already talking about that. We are talking about not just the buildings and the internal environment, but also the spaces outside and all the spaces in between. And we want to explore that using a multi-sector approach between health, so our NHS, um, public health, architecture colleagues and planning colleagues. And very importantly, we want to focus on areas of inequalities. So we've received funding to do this programme from the Academic Health Science Network and we're supporting our integrated care system here in the North East to deliver this. So our core team is, is myself as a programme manager and we've got Tim as our planning lead and we've got Holly who's our project support. So we've got a mixed bag of backgrounds and skills as you'll see from the slide there. Next slide please. Just a little bit about the geographical and strategic scope that this program sits within. So I've said we're based in the northeast and North Cumbria, and that's our scope that we're focusing on for this project um, in terms of on the ground stuff. So our HSN um, was established in 2013 and we work predominantly with NHS trusts and small businesses. So this program is a little bit of a deviation from that. It's a bit of a testing of the concept, um, working with our local authorities, public health colleagues, but also the voluntary sector as well, um, and planning and architecture too. Um, and matching that geograph uh, geography is the integrated care system. Um, these are not statutory bodies yet, but they will become statutory in April of this year. And these emerged from the NHS long term plan. And essentially, this is about how you develop collaborations across organisational boundaries. And importantly, it's about operating at not just a regional level, but at a place based and a neighbourhood level. So that's the kind of context that we're working in, in terms of the mental health element of this programme. Next slide, please. So our wider vision for the programme is ultimately to develop a concept for a sustainable innovation hub here in the North East and North Cumbria. 
and looking at how we create healthy happy environments through those collaborations between different sectors and importantly how we'll look at new ways to invest in those new and existing places too. Um, so to achieve that we're looking at doing events like this, um, sharing knowledge between sectors. We know there's loads of good work already happens, um, so we really want to try and draw on some of that and look at it from a strategic point of view, but also do some really on the ground stuff here in the northeast and um, through participatory planning projects. Um, I'm going to stop there in the interest of time, but if you want to find out more about the programme, there's our link to our web page there. You can sign up to our mailing list and there's our team contacts on at the bottom. Holly, I'll hand over to you. Hi everyone, so just really quickly would like to make a real time uh, word cloud on what does biophilic design me to mean to you. Um, so if you access slido.com, I've just put the details in the chat um, and you enter the number 728142 um, and just pop in there what, what biophilic design means to you and hopefully words will start popping up soon. I'll just give that a minute. So give this some time now. This is exciting, good, isn't it? Oh, it's like watching the cake rise in the oven. Right. Fantastic. Nature at the center. Oh, some lovely words in here, non-separateness. Stolen the words right out of my mouth. Oh, wow, fractals as well, brilliant. 1990s, woo! <laughs> brilliant, that's amazing. What a lovely collection of words. That's fantastic. We, we tend to use these to um introduce uh, what we're about really in terms of these different areas of work so that's fantastic that's really good before we launch at the presentations um i suppose i'll give you my views biophilia is the passionate love of life as one definition says and i really do like that and i think it's particularly important when we think that we often have a very mechanistic view about nature and i think that this actually is a realization that there's something far deeper and there's something that's actually inside us that responds so well in that close affinity that we actually have with nature in fact going as far as we are nature no nature no us so oh this is wonderful absolutely amazing okay well it's time for our pre first presentation i would like to introduce to you our first partner is bill browning partner at terrapin bright green the floor is yours bill thank you Thank you for having me uh, join today. I'm really excited to uh, be part of this conversation and see this larger effort. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about some of our work in uh, gathering research and participating in research on human experiences of nature. So when we see certain places and they're beautiful, we don't have to be told that they're beautiful. We just sort of intuitively know that this is a, a good place to be. And so a lot of our work is exploring the intuitively obvious, trying to understand what is it about that experience that elicits that response and looking at those responses both psychologically and physiologically. The word biophilia comes from the social psychologist Eric Fromm, literally from the Greek words love and life. And the working definition comes from the Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson, uh, the innate emotional affiliation of humans of other living organisms. And one of the things that, you know, I have to sort of remind a lot of people when we get deep into this is that we can get very deep in the science and forget that, the, that there's that love component, that emotional component as well. And so, a lot of the science really points to this concept called the Savannah hypothesis. Humans 
evolved on the savannas of Africa, and it makes sense that we respond to that environment. And so you see copses of shade tree, distant views, calm grazing animals. There's water in the view. It's even more uh, beneficial. If you see other evidence of humans, it's also more beneficial. And in fact, there have been studies of artwork around the world, and the most preferred piece of art, regardless of culture, has aspects of that savanna-like view. Some of the early work comes from, uh, from comes from the UK, from the work of Jay Appleton, a landscape geographer, who asked, why is it I would look in one direction and I see a view that I really love, and I might turn my head 90 degrees and go, ah, nah, not so much. So he started breaking down the components of that view into uh, what are called semantic elements, processing elements within the brain, uh, which is a whole thread of science today on semantic processing. And he identified a couple conditions that are within preferred views. The first one is this idea of prospect, an unimpeded view through space. If it has those sorts of savanna-like components, it's even better. So if you're up on a hill and you see water in the distance, you see copes of shade trees, all of these things together, that's a prospect view. A second condition is called refuge. It's where my back is protected and I may have a canopy overhead. And you know, if we think about uh, a classic example of that, this obviously is a prospect and refuge uh, condition together in this image. But if we think about a, a traditional pub and you've got maybe round tables or square tables in the middle and around the perimeter, you may have a raised plinth with a high back booth. And inevitably, people want the booth first. And so when they're in the booth, they've got a great refuge condition, but they've got a view across the whole rest of the of the pub. And so there you have prospect and refuge together in an indoor space. For a long time, there's been discussion of what is happening within our brain when we are experiencing nature. And you can see even in the mid 1800s in the in the writing of landscape architect uh, Olmsted, and he's uh, before he did work on Central Park, he also did work uh, for the US Congress on creating a park in Yosemite Valley. And in his description of the experiences there, he says, being here in calms the mind, but invigorates the body. And what we see this again and again, and being nature is calming and all that, the state of experience is called soft fascination. And after you have this state of soft fascination, while you're navigating in nature, you come back and you have better cognitive capacity. And so this became known as attention restoration work uh, theory through the work of Rachel and Stephen Kaplan at the University of Michigan. About 12 years ago, the neuroscience caught up with it. And we now know that in fact, what happens when I'm experiencing nature, particularly even just viewing an image of nature, within 40 seconds, the prefrontal cortex quiets down. After I've had that experience, I now have restored cognitive capacity, better short-term memory performance, a whole cascade of psychological benefits. It turns out, you know, the question then had been, how long do you have to have that experience? And work from the University of Melbourne indicates that it only takes 40 seconds of viewing a scene of nature for that to occur. We are also really fascinated with another area of visual processing. Um, there are patterns that occur again and again within nature. Fractals are self-repeating mathematical forms. Um, those are exact or regular fractals, like the Mandelbrot sets and the, the sort of trippy stuff that you would see in the 90s. What's more common are statistical fractals that are repeating forms, but they're not exact. Um, there's variation between them, but those occur all over the place in nature. The waves on a beach, the dancing flames in a fireplace, the bracts on a fern leaf, the snowflake pattern. 
those are all statistical fractals and they occur so frequently within nature that when we see them in human designed objects it's much easier for the brain to process them and the brain processes them with ease and very quickly and so that inst almost instantaneously you can measure a drop in stress through galvanic skin testing heart rate and other measurements and so the neuroscientists use the term fractal fluency saying that the brain is fluent with those ideas and those experiences and so when we see them in human designed objects they lower our stress level we're also interested in uh, other senses as well we've been doing work lately on scent and uh, digging into some things around that we also are interested in uh, and particularly in sound and in you think about an awesome environment sound distraction is a, actually a major economic problem after i've been distracted by sound and i'm trying to do a task it may take me as long as 23 minutes to get back on task that's a huge loss in productivity so the question is how long you know what can i use as a masking sound to address that work done by Fraunhofer institute in uh, germany they were asked to do research and they looked at a whole series of sounds as pure acoustic masking. So white noise, pink sound, bird song, music, uh, sound of flowing water, active noise cancellation. Of all of those, the most effective from acoustic standpoint is white noise. Now I have to though separate from um, acoustics from psychoacoustics. Acoustics are really, really important from a design standpoint. It tells us how loud, how the sound is bouncing around. It tells us what sound is coming to our ear. It doesn't tell us what we are hearing. We receive so much sound input simultaneously that the brain subconsciously filters what it's going to focus on. And so if we think about back pre-COVID when we could be in a busy pub or at a party and all that and there are all these conversations going on in the room and you're standing talking to your friend and you're hearing what they're saying and they're hearing what you're saying you are still receiving every other conversation in the room is still coming into your ear but the brain is in effect set up a separate channel and is focusing on that one conversation and point six of some other conversation in the room scanning to see if someone is probably because we're social critters seeing if someone's saying something bad about you. So if you repeat the sound masking uh, experiment, it turns out the sound of flowing water uh, is by far the best. And as um, uh, the environmental psychologist Judith Hirwagen points out, it makes perfect sense that that would be a sound that we are attuned to. If we evolved on the savannas of Africa, there is water there, but that presence is is somewhat rare and the purest cleanest source of drinking water is going to be well aerated like a little waterfall or a small stream and so it makes perfect sense that our brain is most attuned to that sound and will focus on that sound and and filter out almost everything else there's also been interesting work on bird song and bird song is particularly intriguing for perceptions of safety in a space and this comes from probably from the fact that if there's birdsong in a space and it suddenly stops in a natural ecosystem, that usually means that there's a serious predator afoot. And so we are really attuned to birdsong. And in fact, in a lot of indigenous cultures, they can even tell you what predator is afoot by the shift in the way that the sound shifts from the birds. So if we put all these pieces together, we find that um, there are a number of benefits to biophilic design and bringing these experiences into the built environment. Those benefits are uh, have tangible results. You know, if we think about the cost of operating an office, and these are North American numbers uh, on an annual basis, I come from the green building world where we focus on carbon and we focus on energy costs. But that's just 1% of the operating cost of a building on an annual basis. The people are the real, real cost of the building. And so 
let's focus on ways that <clears throat> both improve the environmental performance and also improve the experience and performance of people. Over the years, we've come through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers, categorized them of these different experiences in nature and, and developed a pattern language of different experiences of nature. Now, pattern languages, particularly in uh, the UK, have been used uh, for centuries by designers and builders. Uh, this is a little different that it's not a pattern language of objects, it's a pattern language of experiences uh, that occur within nature and elicit different responses. And so here are those 15 patterns. Uh, they fall into three broad categories. Nature and the space are direct experiences of nature. Natural analogs are indirect experiences of nature. And uh, the nature of the space are the three-dimensional characteristics. So visual connection to nature is the one that most people first think about biophilia. What do you see in nature? Um, and yet there are 14 other different experiences, um, many of which don't involve any plants. Um, and others are intriguing, like the biomorphic forms and patterns get into the fractal fluency. We've already talked about the prospect and refuge and the nature of the space. So 15 patterns is, um, is a little tough to remember all of them, and you certainly wouldn't want to try to use all of them in one space. Uh, a, you don't have the budget, and B, it probably would not be effective. And one of the things we've learned coming through the science is that different patterns elicit different responses. So if I know what outcome I need to support for the people in the space, then this allows me uh, to filter which patterns might be most appropriate for a space. So it's a tool uh, to think through how I'm going to implement biophilic design. One of the earliest examples and pieces of science was the work of Roger Ulrich at Texas A&M University, who in 1984 published a study where they're looking at patients recovering from one specific surgery. Patients were coming from all over the country for this surgery to this hospital. And uh, it was a surgery that had a gallbladder surgery that had a long recovery time. Half of the patients uh, in the study were in rooms that had a view to a brick wall, and the other half of the patients had a view to a small group of trees and shrubs. They matched the demographics of the patients and even the paint color of the room, and the view became the, the one distinct uh, statistically significant variable. And what they noticed was the patients who had the view to nature, not some spectacular landscape, just some trees and shrubs, uh, got on of the hospital about one day sooner than the other patients, took half of the number of painkillers sometimes, and had almost half the number of nursing calls of the patients who didn't have the view to nature. So this helped launch the entire Healing Gardens movement and taken to its, uh, take into a fully developed idea of this. This is Kutek Pak uh, Hospital in Singapore, a public hospital. This is the roof of the clinical ring. Um, and it is a community garden. And across you're seeing the wards. And so you see some little sky gardens on the ward, but also the wards are set up so the patients have the view to this garden and a rainforest garden between the two buildings. To focus not just on plants and all this, this is a year long experiment that we did in Baltimore in an inner city uh, school, a sixth grade mathematics classroom, where the interventions in the classroom were using carpet tiles, wallpaper freeze, and window blinds with a statistical fractal pattern, a pattern of tree branch shadows. The carpet tiles have biomorphic uh, collinear patterns. You see the abstraction of palm leaves around the room. And what we found was this had a really amazing calming effect on the, on the students in this space. Um, and compared to prior uses of that space with the same teacher teaching the same curriculum, dramatic improvement in academic performance. We also did biometric testing as well, and we found that um, these characteristics in the room led to measurable uh, improvement in stress recovery. 
If you want to read more about these topics, you can find a whole series of publications on the Terrapin website that can be downloaded for free. Um, and we also, uh, in 2020, published with the Royal Institute of British Architects a book on uh, biophilic design called Nature Inside. Thank you. Wow, thanks very much, Bill. That's awesome. Um, just looking at the chat, um, clearly uh, hit the uh, hit the mood of the room there. Fantastically, uh, some lovely comments there. Uh, one special comment I'd like to say from me as chair today: the focus on people is fantastic. You know, the point you made about we focus on the building very often and running it and all those things, and it's the human cost to getting this wrong is massive. And, and I think that's a real a real touchstone reminder about what we're about here. So absolutely brilliant. Thanks so much, Bill. And you'll be staying around for the question and answer, yeah? I'll be here, yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's brilliant. Right, next up, we have um, Dr. Abby Taran jones clinical psychologist and nature outdoor therapist from TZ Queer Valley's NHS Foundation's Trust. Abby, are you there? Hey, yes. awesome. Hi, Tim. Right, I'll Hi, hand over Tim. to you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, uh, thanks very much for that, Bill. That was really helpful, actually, for my presentation. You covered a few of my areas, um, which is particularly useful because I'm um, battling with a bit of a uh, non-COVID cough today, so I'm going to do my best to get through through this. Um, can you let me know if you can see um, see the PowerPoint? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, okay. great. Okay, so. Yeah, my name is Abby Taran Jones. I'm a clinical psychologist. I do work my substantive post within the NHS, um, but it's uh, within my private practice that I typically do more ecotherapy. Um, so my email address, my private email address is there if people have any questions about it. Unfortunately, I won't be able to stay for the question and answer because I've got a clinic to get back to. Um, but I'm going to give you a bit of a, hopefully, a whistle stop tour to what ecotherapy is, um, a little bit of an introduction to eco-psychology that underpins e ecotherapy, um, an idea of the benefits of being in nature, which Bill's really helpfully kind of already explored, um, and how I use nature in my therapy and what I've found the outcomes um, have been for both myself and, and the client. So ecotherapy or nature therapy or outdoor therapy is an umbrella term that it really describes activities that involve nature with the aim of reducing suffering and enhancing well-being and health. And it comes in all shapes and sizes, um, different things that you might have heard of, uh, horticulture therapy, forest bathing, adventure therapy where people go off and um, do expeditions, surf therapy, going and developing wilderness skills or fire, fire lighting skills, survival skills in the woodland, equine assisted therapy. There's so many different activities that are facilitated to promote the health and well-being of others. And they differ in terms of how much outdoor skill or specialist um, kind of uh, training is, is required on part of the facilitator. Um, versus how much psychotherapeutic skill is 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 kind of required. So what I typically facilitate is something called walk and talk, which is psychological therapy outdoors. So I guess eco, uh, eco psychology is kind of underpinned by the idea that we're fundamentally connected to and influenced by nature. Um, and Basically, that um, our human nature connections can improve our well-being and our interpersonal relationships. And interestingly, the, it's the idea that not only it's not necessarily that we're strengthened through our connection with nature. So we get a lot of information around the benefits of nature on our health and physical well-being and psychological well-being. Um, but there's a concept that actually it's our disconnection from nature that causes suffering and weakens us. Um, uh, and that comes back down to that idea that essentially we are nature. Um, but over years, we've evolved to become increasingly disconnected. And in eco psychology, they look at this idea that humans habitually have started to live and work in ways that are very destructive. 
to the other than human world. And this is kind of deeply intertwined with kind of the uh, environmental and um, climate crisis that we're dealing with at the moment. Um, and this idea that as humans, we think of ourselves differently and we can use land and we can um, burn fossil fuels and we can um, uh, impact kind of the biodiversity of the world without giving it much thought and the fact that we're different or somehow superior to to those other than other than human um, uh, species and what eco psychologists are really interested in is trying to consciously kind of promote an idea of reciprocal healing between humans and the world and nature so a lot of the focus in ecotherapy is yeah we benefit from being in nature like it's good for our health but an eco psychologist wants to say well yeah it's good for your health but how is it good for nature so in i guess in ecotherapy um i'm interested in trying to help people to promote and deepen their relationship with nature so that then they become more um protective of it and engage with nature in a way that is sustaining and healing for the natural world as well. So, <coughs> we've already kind of talked about the psychological benefits of nature. These are some of the ideas here around kind of stress um, reduction and promote, promoting kind of calm and healing and regeneration. But like all of us have experienced this, how many of us have kind of walked along the beach and looked over at the sunset and felt a sense of calm or stood at the foot of a mountain and looked up at its sheer size and felt a sense of awe or curiosity and noticed a wave of contentment come over them. You know, this is something that we experience and we notice day in, day out. Other things that's psychologically beneficial about nature is it usually brings us into connection with other people as well and animals um, and so it reduces our sense of social isolation and loneliness and also restores our attention capacity which Bill's already really helpfully um, discussed. The physical benefits of nature so kind of walking, running, cycling, doing anything really in nature that involves some level of exercise no matter how little um, it, it has a positive impact on the body. It lowers blood pressure, blood sugar levels. It decreases the prevalence of <coughs> lifestyle diseases like chronic, um, uh, like heart disease, uh, diabetes, <coughs> and it helps to boost the immune system. So this is where kind of Bill's example comes in around kind of people having um, quicker recovery rates from surgery when they've got a view of nature and there's something about their natural environment boosting the immune system and reducing inflammation in the body. So why is nature so health so restorative? There's four principles that have been identified that promote the restorative value of natural natural spaces that there's something important about developing or promoting awe and fascination and curiosity and that can be um, beneficial. That there's something in just getting away from the daily hustle and bustle of everyday life, of work, of family responsibilities, of the treadmill of responsibility. And there's something important about feeling part of a greater whole and I think this is really significant because lots of people don't really see themselves as nature. Um, but we are, we are part of nature. Everything that we do is part of nature. And as soon as we start to connect with that, there's a sense of a containing other that's there, that we're never alone, that we're part of this, um, uh, a greater sense of being. And, and also because it might be compatible with one's own natural inclination. So those are the restorative em uh, environments. <coughs> so... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So I use nature in a few ways. Yes, nature is it's the easiest, I guess, to take therapy outdoors, OK, to be able to do walk and talk, to have those conversations that I would be having with somebody in a natural environment. 
whether that's kind of actively walking or sitting on a bench and looking out at, a, a, at scenery or sitting by this by the side of a lake and listening to the water or I bring nature inside I can't take everybody outside um, or not everybody is ready to do that people with anxiety for example some of them are extremely afraid of going outside and maybe agoraphobic so bringing natural kind of plants and items into the therapy room and getting them to connect with those can be really beneficial. Other people are really restless with their anxiety and need to move and they want to be outside. And another thing I might do is to set nature based homework. So we might be reflecting on something important in, in therapy and I'll, I'll invite them to take those thoughts to a natural place to mull over. And what people can find is <coughs> by being in the natural environment, they are enabled to feel more kind of calm, and um, that helps them to think through what they need to what they need to do next. Um, I use nature as a co-therapist, and this is really important. So in, in a variety of ways, I might involve nature through mindfulness. Um, so that is by kind of grounding people um, by using their five senses when they're not out in a natural environment or when they're involved with things that are natural around them, even if that's indoors. Getting somebody to tap into what they can see, what they can hear, what they can taste, what they can touch, what they can smell is really, really helpful in bringing people back down and anchoring them in the present moment. And it's really useful to do that in an, an, in an external and natural environment because there's so much sensory information there to be able to hold on to. Um, and it enables people to come back into their body. In psychology, we're extremely cognitive a lot of the time. We're like, what are you thinking? Um, what, how do you make sense of that? What are you reflecting on right now? We're already always kind of pulling people in to think cognitively. What we want to try and do in, in nature therapy is to help people to come back into the body, to be able to find the heart and the spirit um, and the body of what they're dealing with. Um, and so we can do that by enabling people to focus back on the breath, the sensation of, of breathing in a natural environment, of feeling the sensation of their feet as, it, as, as they walk along the ground and, and notice themselves kind of um, being held by the ground in that in that moment, but also a sense of movement. We use a lot of metaphor in nature based therapy, in all psychological therapy we use in metaphor, to be to be honest, but natural metaphor is really helpful. I mean, the very art of walk and talk metaphorically means we're moving, we're in motion, we're becoming unstuck. And the majority of people come for psychological therapy because they feel stuck, because they're in a rut. They talk about being in a black hole and not being able to climb out. So if we put therapy in motion, it, it's almost like it becomes freeing. We start to see people actively move out of those positions and to be more creative in the design of the coping strategies and much more collaborative in that process. Another thing about the natural environment that's great is it's really um, it breaks down the barriers of power, of power imbalance. They get to see see me as a therapist in my natural habitat, habitat as a human being, and it helps to to build that sense of collaboration in the in the work that we do. And we also are trying to build on their sense of developing a, a relationship with nature. This idea that nature is a part of us and we're a part of nature, and when we get that that we're never alone, that there's always this other beside us walking, uh, walking with us on our journey is really, really powerful. Um, and I guess just thinking about, well, what does this mean? What does this work then do for, for, for the people that I'm working with, but also for myself? I think if I think about myself initially, you know, I, I stepped into this work for a reason because my day to day job in the NHS and under the pressure and the stress of the pandemic has been quite depleting for a long time now. 
And it was important that I was able to do something that I found was restorative for me and to uh, fit with my own natural inclination to, to, to be, I guess, in nature. I'm a trail runner. Um, it is where I get my therapy fix, getting out on the trails and being in the open um in the open and being in nature and i noticed when i was struggling at a time in my life that that's where i wanted to be and i thought well if this is where i want to be when i'm struggling with my emotions why do i sit in a box with people who are there most vulnerable and most distressed and expect them to be able to work through it and that's not to say that everyone should do ecotherapy or that it's for every therapist it's not um, but we're all individual. Um, and for those that are this way inclined, it is extremely engaging um, and freeing. Um, it is inspiring for me and it's definitely refreshed my work and my outlook on, on the work that I'm doing with, with, with my clients. I'm getting to be in nature, which, which is what I love, and I'm getting to help people, which is what I love. So it's a win-win. Um, and my clients have talked about how they felt really engaged. I often work with, with people who haven't got very far in traditional indoor therapy settings, found that quite stale, quite um, restrictive or extremely anxiety provoking. Um, and they've talked about how this has been something that's captivated them, that's really kept their interest, that's enabled them to stay in therapy, that, to want to stay in therapy. And it's been motivating. Thanks, Tim. Um, and it's been extremely motivating to for them to have a different um, a different approach. Another thing that's significant is in a therapeutic relationship, we're always thinking about what makes a, a good enough ending, um, so we don't kind of recreate um, a sense of abandonment that maybe that somebody might have experienced throughout their lives before or a sense of being kind of forgotten or overlooked or, or, or dismissed at the end of therapy because, well, they're fixed, they've, they've had their lot. The wonderful thing about working in nature is that work, that piece of work that you did sat next to a river provides a tangible object for that person to go back to. They can always come back to you to your discussions, to your conversation by being in that place, or potentially not by being that being in that place at all, by being by any river or by being around the sound of moving water, which kind of brings what Bill was talking about earlier. By, by kind of bringing those natural elements indoors or into the buildings that you're working with or in the natural environment directly outside the buildings, we can start to use them as kind of transitional objects how can we hold on to what we've done in therapy and still kind of continue it by using it i guess parallels in the natural world around us um and people talk about that they've moved they've moved on that sense of no longer stuck that they've been active and moved through something that they didn't have before when they tried typical indoor therapy um, but I think that that's all I've got time for. So thank you very much for, for listening. Um, I hope that it was a helpful introduction. I know it was a bit of a whistle stop tour. So that was awesome. Um, sorry, I, I haven't been tough but harsh or tough but fair <laughs> in terms of timings. Thank you yep. so much. That's brilliant. Um, really, really good. If you can just hang on for one minute because Holly's got a couple of questions that are coming. Yeah, please do. That's do fine. That. That'd be great. Hi, Abby. I've just got a couple of questions from the chat. Um, I, I often see young people expressing feelings that being in nature increases their anxiety because it reminds them of what is being destroyed. Can you respond to that if you have also come across this experience? Yeah, I think that there is a sense of kind of climate related anxiety, um, particularly in the um, for younger people um, that they're kind of seeing their world destroyed. I guess what I would want to support people in doing is how can they proactively engage with the thing that creates anxiety for them. So there might be some things that they want to do in terms of campaigning, but it also might be something that they want to do in terms of trying to find a soothing and grounding 
um, presence in the natural world so that it's not something that's constantly threatening and kind of that they're getting pulled into that quite hyper vigilant position towards anxiety. So I, I guess I would want to encourage them to find ways to engage with nature in a way that soothes them at the same time as using that anxiety they have proactively um, uh, uh, to, to try and uh, meet some goals to, to, to promote their well-being and their thoughts. Um, is augmented reality considered a useful tool? Um, it's not something I'm uh, really an expert on, so um, I, I'm not sure that I can contribute to that um, right now, but I'll have a look into it and come back. Uh, what have you found has been the longevity of the benefits of being in nature? Do these beneficial feelings or experiences last five minutes, an hour or one day? I think it's really variable on the individual and the situations that they might be experiencing at that time. Um, I think that we probably want to promote the benefit of being in nature for a small amount of time as possible. I think some people see nature as it's got to be this really big thing that I get to go to and it feels quite distant and far away. And they don't recognize that just simply walking down the street and looking up and noticing the trees and the bird song and the, the wind whistling through the canopy is nature. And I think that we need to start to promote our capacity to engage with it in that way. Even seeing the weeds popping up through the paving stone, the cracks in the paving stones, you know, that's nature. Like, how can we become curious and um, and have awe about that? Like, that's really good. It doesn't need to be this expedition for, for a weekend where we start to see benefits of being in nature. We need to break it down and make it smaller and value the chunks we can get in our day to day. Excellent, thank you. I've got a few more questions, but if you if you need no, to go, just okay. tell me to be sure. <laughs> um, okay. Is there a, is there no scope for incorporating nature into your NHS role? Yeah, no, absolutely. This is my next my next uh, venture. I think there's a big push in um, community mental health care at the moment about um, people may or may not be aware of the community transformation agenda which is where we're trying to break down the boundaries between NHS, local authority, private sector and charitable organisations and the care that people can get access to. So that essentially where somebody has a difficulty, there should be no wrong door um, and they should be able to access care um, by any of those um, organisations and services at any point and move fluidly and freely through, through them. And I think this is going to give us a big opportunity to start to, on a community level, develop programmes that are more kind of eco-therapeutically um, uh, focused um, to try and help promote uh, the people in typical NHS um, services to get access to this type of um, intervention. But I think I'm working right now on an individual level, so that's a real postcode lottery. If people around and close to me um, happen to come across me, um, and then and then uh, I happen to have capacity to see them, it's a real postcode lot lottery. What I would like to do is to start developing groups and interventions that enable larger um, populations to be able to access and benefit from natural ecotherapies. Brilliant, thank you. I think that's all the time we've got, is it Tim? <laughs> it is, yeah, we've, we've got to move on because we're on a tight schedule. So thanks Holly and thank you, Abby. that was absolutely brilliant. I can see the inspiring things that are coming in the chat. So uh, not least of which, this should be on national news, which I, I wouldn't disagree with. So that's awesome. Thanks very thank much, Tim. So thank you all. Brilliant. That's fantastic. Right. Next up, we have Natalie Baxter, Head of Workspace at Home Group, talking to us about biophilic design in the workplace. The floor is yours, Natalie. Thank you. Great. I'll just try and full screen mode this. Can you let me know if you can see that? Yeah, cool. Right. Great. Hi everyone, um, I'm Natalie Baxter, I'm Head of Workspace at Home Group. Um, Home Group are a social housing association. 
we build homes to buy, to rent, and we also have an integrated care services offer. Um, I myself am an architect and spatial strategist with um, experience in practice and practice in academia as well. Um, so in my role at Home Group, I'm working through a new ways of working strategy um, in relation to hybrid working for Home Group. And I'm looking at reevaluating the workspace portfolio of 30 offices to align with that. Um, so we have about three and a half thousand colleagues across those 30 offices and we have a headquarters currently at Gosforth Parkway just outside of Newcastle Town Centre. But the project I'm going to talk to you about today is our new headquarters which has been built in Newcastle City Centre. So um, the project's called One Strawberry, One Strawberry Lane um, and there's an ambition at the beginning of this project to really try and improve the health and well-being of colleagues um, in the workspace and that was a primary focus of the, of, the, of the project really to create an environment that really supported health and well-being over and above the current office and not really particularly in the interest of productivity but in the interest of creating a really good val uh, values-based culture in the organisation um, and a community of colleagues in the workplace and I think Following the pandemic as well, and we've been working from home a lot, and I know a lot of other organisations have done as well. Um, the the ability to be able to have a bit more flexibility and freedom in your, your work and routine and your daily routine has allowed um, colleagues to have the opportunity to be able to go for a run, to go for a walk, to access outdoor space or move with, within their home to be able to access sunlight, things like that, um, on a much more kind of freeing basis. And that's something that we've really taken away from the pandemic and want to um, be able to provide for colleagues in the future in the new workspace. So. Um, the new workspace has a lot of different concepts to it. Um, we're looking at flexibility and adaptability to be able to move workspace environments within the workspace. Um, we're looking at accessibility to be able su to support um, equality, diverse, diversity and inclusion in the workspace. Um, we're looking at providing a landscape of choice for colleagues to support neurodiversity and choice. Um, and we're also looking as part of that, obviously um, the theme today, um, to look at biophilia as a connection to nature and the natural, natural environment to support all of those um, other concepts that I've, I've just mentioned there. So there's a lot going on, but today specifically um, I've drawn up a, a few examples of where we've used um, biophilic design principles um, and tried to apply them to the workspace design. So hopefully you'll notice some of uh, Bill's concepts um, coming through in it, coming through in our design. So this is one strawberry lane. Um, you can see it there. Um, it was it's on site at the moment. The contractor is BAM. Um, Rider Architecture are, are the Cat A contractors, so they look after the shell of the building and the central core services. Um, DLA are the Cat B architects and they are um, looking after the fit out of the of the internal of, of the office. Um, and it's due to complete in September 22. So it's located in Newcastle, if you know it, off, just opposite St James's Park. Strawberry Place is the road along here and Strawberry Lane is the, the road that um, sits at a right angle to that. And this is an image of the building. So this is a very well known uh, Strawberry Pub. If you're a Newcastle United supporter, you might know it. And the building wraps around um, the outside of that in a previously disused car park. So this is Strawberry Place and this is Strawberry Lane here and the entrance to our building is here. So the building is, as I mentioned before, is really uh, there to try and create a community and um, that's not just going to be for home group colleagues, it's going to be for home group tenants as well. So we have two floors in the building and um, that are going to be let. So if you know anybody who's looking for workspace in Newcastle, please do let us know. Um, but at the ground floor, it's really a um, community centre for the voluntary community sector. And um, so there's startup areas, there's uh, meeting rooms and um, there's collaborative co-working spaces and there's public areas as well. So what we really want to do is bring in anybody who's interested to come in and have a coffee with us and um, support the voluntary community sector and um, help them with the challenges they might be facing on the day and uh, network with other people in the region um, and support kind of new and upcoming initiatives. So as we're a housing association, um, you can imagine that we didn't want the office to look like an ivory tower. Um, and it was really important to us that it was accessible and it was homely and humble and quirky and fun rather than corporate or civic. Um, so the interior design strategy has really been designed around making sure that it has that sort of aesthetic and it is very warm and inviting. Um, and part of that is to bring greenery into the space. And part of that is also that 
the, the uh, multi-sensory experience that you get by kind of touching a tactile fabric and um, that reminds you of home um, or a certain smell of, of flowers that may remind you of the flowers you've got on your dining room table and all these sorts of references and also differences in lighting strategy as well so where you might have a lamp on a table that's got a bit of a warmer dimmer light and um, rather than the typical kind of cat a spec offices that you might see with strip lighting and, and kind of linear desking and a raised access floor and um, so really trying to create a, a, a homely and humble quirky aesthetic. So four examples of biophilic design that I've picked out for you today um, from the design of the, the new headquarters is the front garden concept and the community allotment concept and the clearing area and the strawberry fields. And all of these um, are, are really quite good examples of where we've taken quite a literal concept that would be very easily recognisable, um, but then tried to develop it into the building to enhance kind of the community um, of the space and enhance that community interaction and the collaboration. So the front garden concept, um, and this is a this is an area that we looked into quite early on um, and then decided to revise kind of following the pandemic. So you can you can see here that there's a, a load of cars sat outside the building. It's a very hard and abrupt um, environment that we're with, with our sites in and that we've had to work with. Um, there's a large open staircase here. Um, and this is quite civic in scale. It's very large, it's very large, it's very abrupt, it's hard concrete staring. Um, and it's quite difficult for the visually impaired to be able to walk up this because the, the steps are feathered um, and they lead up to an entrance space here, but it's not so obvious where that entrance space is in that large um, plane of curtain walling. So it's also um, kind of reinforced to us um, since COVID and that, that accessibility to outdoor space that actually with, with the office that we have, we don't have a rooftop terrace and we have very limited outdoor space given the site that it's been built on. So there was an opportunity there to make more of that area and to be able to provide some outdoor public realm for colleagues to be able to break out onto lunch times or to be able to get a break from the internal environment and um, depending on the tasks of the day. And this is another um, view of the of the building entrance looking up towards the strawberry pub. So you can see that the lighting here is quite dim. The buildings are quite close together um, and that our building is very tightly situated um, in that site that wraps the strawberry pub. So we've worked closely with the designers um, to come up with um, an external landscaping strategy um, and our site, our site boundary literally is the line of these um, planters that you can see, but to try and create a buffer between the building and, and the road in front of the building, but also to make use of the south facing orientation um, of the site and make use of that lateral night and give colleagues an opportunity to break out. So. The planters um, are, are at different scales, they're at different heights and the planting within them will change seasonally as well. Um, we're hoping to use colleague to, to ask colleagues to be able to take um, some pride in the garden and our customers as well and come and um, plant, plant it, plants together um, and also be responsible for the kind of maintenance of that and build a community around the garden. Um, but it's not just for home group colleagues, it's for anybody who wants to come and use that space. So as I mentioned before, with the voluntary community sector using this space, we are encouraging that, encouraging this to be a public space and hopefully using some of this planting to pull people through and into the building as well. Um, and where the planting's located and it's coloured, it separates that entrance into a few different zones and makes it really easy to know where the where the staircases are for the visually impaired and um, where the kind of lines of uh, circulation are so that you would move through and up into the building much more easily. So that's, an, that's a, a, vis, a concept visual of um, where that area is and the entrance there. There's a plan here so you can see that there's a, a staircase here, a staircase here, or you ramp up and round and into the building. And the other thing to note just about that is that we have on the inside here, we have a, a, an accessible patio area here, which is slightly lifted. And again, that's got some greenery on it in terms of planting and things. It's south facing, it looks out over that some of the garden here. And that's another visual looking back towards the entrance area. So the, the planters have been designed as well to kind of punch outwards and inwards, and that's to be able to provide accessible spaces for wheelchairs to be able to pull in um, so that they can also feel kind of surrounded by the greenery too. So the second concept to talk about is the community allotment. So 
Um, this is a vertical component that runs through the center of the building. Um, the, the center of the building here is a, is a core area, so and it's a staircase that runs um, around the inside of the building, but the staircase is open, so you can see from the bottom all the way up to the top as well. Um, and that joins all of the floors. So as I mentioned before, we've got a, a public ground floor offer, and then the first and second floors will be lettable space, but the, the staircase is still accessible by everyone. And then levels three, four and five, <coughs> sorry, our home group floors and on the fifth floor we have a strawberry fields um concept which is based on the, the heritage of the site so um the the site itself used to be um used to be a field where the, the nuns of St Bartholomew's would grow strawberries for, to make strawberry wine. Um, so that's where the street names have come from and also where the concept for the building name and um, for the strawberry fields has come from too. So this is a visual that looks across at the green wall at the feature staircase I mentioned before. Um, so the green wall is live, so obviously it has smells and things, and there are lots of benefits that I'm sure you, you know about um, that are usually associated with green walls, such as like air purifying, which is obviously a, a big concern um, post COVID. Um, <clears throat> decreasing in noise, so when you've got a large open space, there's that noise attenuation that it provides and also um, a balance in ambient temperature. And also just a better internal environment, environment and more visual interest. So if the if the planting is alive, it tends to give you a bit more of a patina across the face. And um, we have a, a strategy where we're, we're looking at the certain elements of the um, the wall being able to be changed seasonally. So it gives an an indication of what time of year it is for colleagues when they're inside. And um, but the way it's been designed and the reason that it's there really is to, to try and promote an active design strategy. So when you come into the main entrance, you see the staircase, you see this really intriguing green wall, and it pulls people through to, to use the staircase rather than the lift of the can. Um, the other aspect of the green wall is, is the community aspect. So rather than it just being seen as something that's decorative and in, in isolation, we really wanted it to become part of the building community. So um, as I mentioned before, with the planting strategy, there are shelves on, on, the, on the green wall that wrap around each of the landing points. So each of those landing points can be accessed um, by colleagues and can be um, can be looked after by colleagues too. So we're looking to um, start up community initiatives whereby colleagues and customers, tenants in the voluntary community sector can take sections of the wall to look after um, and also create kind of edible products as well to be sold in the cafe too. This is a visual that looks across um, into the cafe area. So if you came into the, the entrance area and turned left, this is what you'd see. And you can see that there's planting that's been dispersed um, around the, the cafe area. And that started to relate a little bit, I think, to, to what Bill was saying previously when he talked about the prospect and refuge. So we're using, um, we're using, uh, sorry, um, we're using the planting to create um, a shelter in the space as well. Um, and you can see the steps seating around there. So the third concept is the clearing, and this is a multifunction suite. Um, it had a view out to a very hard building on the opposite side. Um, but what we've done here is to try and bring in some of the, the patinas of the natural materials, but in a man-made setting. So this is an interface carpet that's that's themed on like a field. Um, we're looking at the datum lines of, of where you might look over landscape and um, diffusing colour from the, the ground to the ceiling. So we've got a... Um, almost kind of a fade on the colour of the paint from the dark green to the light green at the top. And then the lighting strategy at the top here is diffused and um, it can be the temperature of it can be changed and um, depending on what type of environment you're wanting to create or the temperature or it can be balanced with the, the temperatures outside. And this is a multifunctional space that can be used for kind of recreational activities or for or as workspace for things like training and um, conferences. And the top floor is the strawberry fields, and I'll whiz through this one quickly. Um, and the architecture of the top floor um, and the shape of the building isn't traditional um, or um, kind of regular in its shape. But we'd expect usually with an office building to have a central core and quite a regular floor plate that wraps around it. But part of the interest of the site is how this building um, has some really interesting shapes and they lend themselves to different types of workspace environments. So to the northern area here, we have quite a quiet and concentrative space and that's themed around the clearing. And to the middle here, we have a few cellular spaces which are compartmentalised and are themed around kind of camping and camp vans and enclosed environments within an external space. Um, 
We have a large open plan field area, and this is a really flexible space for gathering like you would at a festival. Um, and then to, on the other side, we've got the, the kind of open and social space, and this is themed around a kind of patio area where you might um, traditionally have a drink. Um, and then we've got a, a, a fresh air space in here where all of the windows are openable at the top of the space to provide natural ventilation. And that's seen as an extension of that patio area. And then all of the interior design um, has, has been designed to try and support these concepts and the, the choices of furniture as well. Although we have a very big range of furniture ops and options to support different ergonomic um, sensitivities. So we've got the, the green carpet here, we've got the mounds, we've got flexible furniture that can be used in different orientations and different formats to support different events. And we've got a much higher ceiling here as well with roof lights bringing natural light into the top of the space. This is an example of the clearing area. So this is an independent working zone, quite a quiet zone. It's got lower lighting, although it still has natural light. Um, it's got this kind of um, diffused lighting feel to it. Um, this can be changed, but as a, as a general setting, um, that, that's what it would be on a day-to-day -day basis. We've got planting um, in all sorts of uh, visionary kind of eye level. So either on a ground kind of sitting sort of uh, level, as if you're sitting, you'd be able to see the tops of the trees. And then from a standing position as well, whether it's around the columns or the top of the tee points. And this is a view across the patio area. So you can see we're using a, a harder uh, floor material here to try and give that kind of harder sense of being outside. And the large open windows with views out towards um, St James's Park and also the, the greenery of the street, streetscape that, that's next to it. And then also um, the green wall you can see just coming around the corner there um, with the community garden on the side. And I've got one more slide, Tim, <laughs> thanks. Um, and this is the fresh air space which looks out over the city um, and you can open these windows here. Um, and it, just to say, with that kind of material uh, palette does run through all of the floors um, and the strategy to be able to try and reference um, natural colours and natural patinas and the furniture has also been um, used throughout. So you can see some of those those tones coming through in the, the underside of the frames of the, the tables and also the chairs as well. And that's just a whistle stop to it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Thank Natalie. You. That's brilliant. Sorry, I, I, I sorry to hover at the end there. I'm just aware that uh, we've got we've got a bit of a bit of a tight time scale towards the end now. Thank you so much. Really inspirational. Again, in the chat, loads of people loving it. Uh, really inspirational scheme. Um, thank you so much. That's brilliant. Hope you can stay around for some questions later. That's yeah, no problem. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, right. Last up, uh, Professor Alistair Scott. Professor of Environmental Geography, Chartered Planner and Chair of Building with Nature Standards Group. Uh, over to you, Alistair. Thanks, Tim. Can you all see the slides? Yep. Great. Well, thanks very much for the invitation to talk on this topic. I want to take you on a conceptual journey, um, building from practice at the kind of the smart, healthy, biophilic city nexus. Um, and whilst I, I intend to do that, often the computer says no. Um, so we're, we're, we will explore this through an urban living partnership program. And that's a research project that was looking at five cities um, of which I'm going to focus on Birmingham. But they're all exploring different ways that academics, policymakers and citizens could come together to try and improve uh, urban living. So today, rather ironically, I'm speaking from Newcastle um, about Birmingham um, and the Birmingham experience was really about trying to integrate the cross disciplinary and also professional uh, expertise, drawing academics, government decision makers and urban communities and businesses together. And it was about co-production for these sort of new ways of doing things, sustainable urban growth. The three gold stars on the diagram on the right reflect the areas that I was particularly involved with. So I was involved with um, managing a work package in the resilient environment side of the project. And today I'm going to really focus on elements of governance and innovation and possibly challenge some of the excellent presentations that we've heard today in terms of some of the problems. Because I think the first point is that often in urban planning, 
the challenges that, that are identified, and we've heard a lot today, are diagnosed, assessed, and treated within the particular sectoral silos. And that often can lead to sort of a whole series of disbenefits. And I've termed this disintegrated development, actually. And what you'll see is that often you've got very relatively few people trying to bring those silos together. And it's a very high risk activity, hence the, the higher wire thing. And, and in, in a sense, what we've got to do is we've got to mainstream this more integrated approach where we don't have people talking in silos about biophilic or talking in silos about health or green infrastructure or economic development or housing. The paper on the left is one that really reflects some of these issues. So on this resilient environment theme, we were quite interested as a research team to think about there was some excellent work going on in Birmingham in the natural environment section led by Nick Grayson on the Green Living Spaces Plan. It was a landmark green infrastructure strategy that really reflected Birmingham's ambition to be the first biophilic city of the UK. And, and equally at the same time, there was a smart city commission being established to put Birmingham, if you like, on the road map of big data and the internet of things and really shape out this, this sort of smart city future. So, so our starting point was really, there's lots of potential synergies for both of these two documents. And these strategies were both being prepared at the same time, but interestingly, they weren't connected. And our research really was thinking about how can, how can this better connect at the city level? And how can this better connect at the, the, the more academic level? And this was particularly given some impetus by Lord Kerslake's report, who, who presented a very critical review of Birmingham's disconnection within the service, and it needed to be fitter for purpose. And so we were using this as our test bed. And I think when we went into more detail of these plans, we saw that whilst they were trying to involve different interests, as the green infrastructure strategy here does, you can see the clear partners on the left, whereas the Smart City Commission was really basing around a sustainable environment, they were not really connecting to each other. And the two sort of leaders of those strategies had not really communicated together either. And it raised really important issues about how they can be fused better together. Now, I'm very aware we've had a lot of information today about biophilic cities in terms of principles, et cetera, but you probably have had less uh, about smart cities. And here there's a definition, and, 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 and this is contested, however, so there's no clear accepted definition for a smart city. But in its simplest term, it's about using information technology to try and tackle key quality of life issues and improve efficiency and service delivery, not just for the people managing and making decisions, but for citizens also. And there you see a particular diagram that reflects the joined up nature of the built environment form, where environment seems to be generally seen as energy reduction type activity. These are the principles, and again, this is taken from the uh, Commission's um, the, the strategy itself. So it was about integration, and you'll see environment is featuring there. It is about that digital aspect and improving the quality of data in terms of its accessibility and also the way citizens engage with it. But what was particularly important for us was seeing the Commission membership. And if you look at the list, environment doesn't feature there at all, which again suggests disconnect that was talked about by Abby in her, in, in, in her presentation. So the biophilic side of it with the Green uh, Spaces Living Plan had seven principles. It also had a, a, a key vision here. And yet again, there seemed to be an opportunity space. So there's the policy space and we came from an academic side saying, okay, well, what's the research opportunity here? Because from, from the literature that we engaged with, it appeared that the environmental and community aspects 
had not really been embedded in the smart city research policy, uh, smart city research and policy, and vice versa. And the role for social and environmental capital or natural capital was definitely clear. But also from the plethora of different hybrid concepts, eco cities, sustainable cities, a whole range of terms, it appeared that there was no one term that really could work on its own to deliver really the sustainable city that we were trying to uh, deal with in this work. So to try and address this, we, we wanted to play around a bit, and that wasn't a game of golf. Um, I did some work about using board games to improve participatory understanding and engagement. And in this research project, we had several research strands that were running through. Uh, you probably can't see them all, but there's about seven there. And we came up with the idea of designing a game around a tube map. And those that know Birmingham will realise Birmingham doesn't have a tube. Um, but this was an idea of showing the intersection of the different research challenges. So sometimes they could be just a, a single station, so it's a single challenge, or there could be an interchange, and you'll see that's two, two different lines intersecting, or a mega station where several lines intersected. And what that did was it enabled our touchstone group, which were policy decision makers, communities, and even young, young people, to understand the different ways that challenges were interrelated. Not only did it benefit them, it benefited researchers to start understanding the interconnections of their own research strands. And this was far more than just playing a game. It was using it as a tool to help the urban diagnostics that one of our key work strands was about. So it actually played a role in improving the diagnostics for the overall nexus that the uh, project was dealing with. And that model here that I've just put up revolves around the way a research team engages with stakeholders, but crucially within a safe space. And in the example previously, the safe space was the game. But what we wanted to do now was to translate that to our smart natural city interface. And so what we did, this was the methodological approach where we, we basically came up with a series of challenges uh, based from a structured literature review. We used that to inform an innovation workshop, which then was, if you like, tested out some, a framework, which was further explored within deeper dives. And then that led to the final output. And that's what I'm gonna focus my attention on now. I haven't got time to go through this in any real big way, but the whole process was shaped from the results of the literature review process, where we were looking at what, what, what are the key things about this nexus between smart and biophilic. And these were the key themes that rose. And what we did was we set these themes up within the next phase, which was the innovation workshop. So. These 25 experts in different groups were able to explore a range of these themes through vignettes, through discussion. And what we did, we brought these people together across this wide area. Now, I'm not going to list them all, you can see them yourselves. So what we're trying to do is to bring that sort of interdisciplinary mix of representatives. And one of the things that I think was really important for me was this group had never met before. A large number of them were completely talking, a brand new conversation. And when you think about these issues and some of the challenges of urban living, it's astonishing to me that that hadn't happened because they were all in a senior management capacity. And that reflects the benefits of doing this kind of approach. So our, we, we developed from those vignettes and those discussions a, a conceptual framework that we then tested, because what we didn't want to do was to, to produce something that wouldn't work in practice. Here are some of, you can see some of the people that we spoke to, project managers involved with some of these projects, and those in Newcastle will remember the Dissington New Garden Village, which was ranked number one on the checklist of the New Garden Villages, but unfortunately didn't, didn't come to fruition. Um, here are the 12 on the left, 
which were all of the deep dives, and that shows the, the different approaches. And the benefit of that was it, it refined the overall framework so it fitted uh, to those. And that's uh, what we came up with. Um, it's not earth shattering, I don't think, but what is important about it, I suppose, is it's not a pick and mix. This is something that is needed when you're dealing with policy interfaces. And, and, and this has wider applicability. It's a hub and spoke model. And I just want to very quickly unpack some of the salient points from it. So the first thing is in the middle, you normally have a vision. No, this was about connections because we wanted the different people, the different technologies and nature to connect across each other. And they don't. And that was one of the points. And here this was illustrated by the fact that we often have a bunch of people saying grey infrastructure bad, green infrastructure good, or vice versa. We came up with silver green because we need to understand that good places require good grey infrastructure, which is silver and green working hand in hand. They shouldn't be at odds with each other. And that generates the multiple benefits. The vision, key word there is the we factor. Um, and that is the fact that it's co-designed. And it's not just about new developments. It's about thinking about new existing places, improving them and enhancing the links between them. Now, in a lot of planning focus, that is neglected. And therefore, that requires a change of governance and culture. It's also about making the data exciting to people so they can interact with it. The board game actually helped do that in a low tech way. But we have technology that can do it far better than bloody well PDFs. Um, and the placemaking aspect, that's the new component, the creating new spaces. But we've got place keeping, which is about existing places and improving them. And here's the key. It's about combining living, learning, working and play together. How often are those components designed separately? We need to think them as part of the smart solutions. And here there's a role for natural capital being used to demonstrate the asset benefits for business and the economy. Moving beyond simply the power of nature in the way that we've heard before, but the economic value of nature. Citizens need data. They need to be able to use it to make decisions. They mustn't be basking sharks, so they're trying to sort of capture all this data that's out there and somehow make sense of it, which often is the problem. And they've got to be able to interact with that data in real time um, and, and, and use it effectively. The final element is the participatory, second to last, is participatory learning space. It's two way. It's not about top down, bottom up. It's about the intersection of them. And it's about people being able to interact with the evidence in, in ways that actually do motivate them. And therefore the participation can occur and that can ultimately lead to improved outcomes. And we obviously need to monitor that. Now, as an academic, I now want to turn the table on myself and say, okay, so this project came up with that. It was a short term 18 month project. And I've called this the seagull syndrome because the project finished, we raised expectations, we generated a framework, we got a lot of traction. So we flew in, we shat, and then we flew off again. And that's the danger of the seagull. You need to actually have the inbuilt investment because otherwise people are back on their escalator where they're working in their silos and it's really difficult to get out of it. Hence the high wire and the umbrellas that started this talk. So we need to break the cycle. And it's just as bad if you're in your environmental silo as well. So it's not just a, 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 an anti-economic element here. Because Birmingham have just produced this today. It's, it's out at the moment, brand new. It's excellent. But yet again, the opportunity space to build upon the tech smart city material has been neglected because of the, 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 the fact that, that, that it hasn't moved forward. They've identified areas for investment that address all of the issues that we've been talking about today. 
but actually we need better data to measure the ecosystem services. We need that kind of intersection to play. And those two strategies are still not joining up. And that's not me throwing a brick back at them. It's reflecting at us. These are my take home messages. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Alistair. Brilliant. Loads of stuff in there. Very, very, very dense information. Um, really important stuff around participatory planning and the importance of existing places because it's often missed in. It's, it's the blind spot, I think, policy wise. And I think existing places are where most people are trying to live at the moment. So um, fantastic. Uh, if we could bring the panel back on uh, while uh, everything's lighting up, I'll just say thanks very much again to, to Alistair. Um, Bill, are you still around as well? And my first question is for you, Bill. I'm going to start off the, what, well, we've got a little bit of time. Hopefully we can just indulge people for a few minutes, if they'll indulge us. Um, you, you've sat through all this now, Bill. You've, you've joined us from the, from the States. Do you have any reflections on what you've seen from the, the UK scene here? Well, we uh, were advisors to the Biophilic Cities Network, so we've been tied in with the Birmingham work for quite a while, and they are really our world leaders in, in thinking deeply about uh, these connections to nature. Uh, they also the work on getting people outside and, and having those experiences. One of the questions that came up earlier was how long does that um, take effect? And the work uh, that we've seen on uh, cortisol levels, the stress hormones uh, research that's been done in Japan and Korea is that even after a 15 minute exposure to nature, uh, cortisol levels will stay down for multiple hours when you go back into the indoor environment. So it's not just a uh, quick, uh, doesn't quickly go away, it, it stays with you. So some real good long-term benefits there. Holly, have you got some more questions for us? Holly's One last piece was I loved Strawberry Fields. That was a great building. <laughs> what a great place to work. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. I have a few have questions for you, Nancy. Actually, actually. So that was a nice. That was a nice segue. Segue. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is it a twenty-four hour space? Um, not at the moment, but it, that is the ambition. So, um, for sustainability reasons as well, Home Group own the building, uh, but we'll have other occupiers and community, hopefully community groups that want to use the space as well. Um, so, in the first instance, um, it'll be open kind of on a daily basis from six o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock at night. Um, but we're hoping to open for 24 hours and at the weekends and the longer term once we can sort out security and, and get into the building and things like that. So, yeah, that is the, the longer term ambition. Great, thank you. Um, if it's a housing scheme, is there an urban allotment? It isn't a housing scheme, it's a workspace, um, but we are a social housing association, so it's themed. Um, you might have noticed externally, um, it's brickwork, pitched roofs, things like that, and that's to reference some of the housing that we build. Um, but the community garden, the vertical garden, is our vertical allotment. Um, so I think it was the second concept that I, that I referenced. Um, so that's really what we're trying to mimic it in terms of a, a domestic garden or a domestic um, allotment um, is to have that for the, the whole building community at the workspace community. Thank you. Um, would you need a full time gardener for the building to manage the plants? Uh, good question. So there's a few ways that you can maintain the planting. Um, so a lot of, of um, green wall suppliers actually offer a maintenance contract as well. So they would come in and um, maintain the green within your space for you because um, it is quite a lot to maintain and dependent on obviously the height of some of the greenery and things that might not be reachable um, or you might need specific equipment um, but for us we're going for a hybrid approach so um, we've got the strips that are reachable and um, that you can easily access where our colleagues will be um, you know the community garden our colleagues will be accessing that and looking after that and um, we've got some of the planting that will be um, maintained by our facilities team so we have a facilities team on site and then some of the the planting that's in the harder spaces to reach and um, will be the the contractor or the su supplier of the green wall um again another question about the green wall having experienced an irritating gnat infestation this summer at home how do you manage this in workspaces and living walls and other plants <laughs> Um, so 
Well, that's a really good question. I'm not a total expert in green walls, but I do know that because our building is sealed. So we've only got one space, which is um, on the top floor that I mentioned before, which it, which has openable windows to the outdoors. If we were designing this, you know, now we probably wouldn't have designed it in the way I have to say we probably would have gone for uh, much more of the, the fresh air and passive house uh, style. But um, the building started about eight years ago um, when we designed it. But anyway, um, so most of the, the, the building is sealed. So the chances of that happening, you know, it could still happen. Um, but we have, you know, double doors at the entrance, wind lobby, all that sort of thing that would um, prevent that from happening in the, uh, well, from being, uh, I guess, more likely. Um, but yeah, that, that is something that you risk with with a green wall. There's lots of other things that can go wrong. Um, you have to, it's it's not an easy undertaking. And also, you know, the building in terms of how it's lit naturally um, will change during the seasons. So you have to to consider how you're going to light the wall differently over the seasons and how the light kind of hits through the through the windows differently um, as the sun obviously um, changes its position. So um, yeah, there's lots to consider there. Great, thanks Natalie. I've got a couple of questions for Alistair as well. Do you want me to just carry on, Tim? Yeah, okay, we'll carry on for a couple, couple more questions, yeah? Maybe one more yeah. bit, yeah. Okay, uh, I've got one for Alistair. Um, is it the younger generation that needs help with getting on the housing ladder? How does urban planning intend to ensure that the younger generation are heard in future planning development schemes? That's a really, really important question because in terms of marginalised or excluded voices, children and youth that generally are uh, rarely heard. There are some great initiatives out there though with uh, youth assemblies that are actually trying to roll shadow the planning committees. And in fact, even in our touchstone group, I don't know if you saw, but we had some, some young people there um, and they were actually engaging. So I, I think the key thing more is to focus much more on schools. And one of the things we're doing at Northumbria, if I can just do a plug for Northumbria with our NU STEM uh, initiative, is we're working a lot with primary schools, getting, getting them much more engaged over the kind of issues, climate change, value of nature, right from the start. And if we can get motivated children working their way through that system, not scared with the fear factor of climate disaster, etc., but actually more about passion for nature. I think that's a really important route in so that they become, as we're starting to see, it's not just the Greta Thunberg syndrome, we're getting a lot of young people, very articulate, very passionate for the environment, and they are starting to make an impact on the decision makers. And I think that that's that to me is really Im important through that, you might say, more guerrilla approach of protest, but there's also these more other conventional avenues. But I, I think there's scope for both, and I would uh, applaud both. Great, cool. thanks, Alistair. I've got one question for Bill. Tim, is that all right? Yeah, that's right. And then we'll yeah. Have to, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, how do you decide which statist statistical fractals will work best in a space, i.e., in a classroom, hospital, or office space? Oh, you're on mute, Bill. One of our favorites is replicating the light patterns, like dappled light under a tree. And we've actually been involved in creating light panels and and light fixtures that do that. Um, but there, we also have a paper on our website uh, that you'll see uh, specifically um, on fractal design and and assistance for designers on choosing fractals. Um, a lot of the research is being done by a team at the University of Oregon, the School of Architecture there, and they write extensively on on choice of fractals. Awesome. Fantastic. I'm glad we're living on fractals. I, I do like it. I think the, the fractal is 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 so symbolic of what we're talking about here, which is the the, 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 the sort of order that lies behind what is on the face of it. it. Looks like chaos, but it isn't. There's a massive order in the, the plan for nature, which is all around us. Um, thank you so much to all our speakers today. I found it really, really inspiring. Some of the chat has been even more inspiring. Um, you know, this is really demonstrative of working around the edges. You know, we've got people from all different disciplines getting together and we can apply all this now to try and solve some of the problems of our age. Um, it's been an absolute privilege to be with you this afternoon. 
follow us for the next one. Next time we are covering the diversity, the, di the neurodiverse city. So that's our next webinar. Please join us for that. Uh, and in the meantime, take care. Bye-bye now.